Hello everybody and welcome to a new episode here on my channel. There are some pretty clear differences between the R6 and the R7, like for example the sensor size and the price, but I was interested in making this comparison because the R6 is a camera I know very well. I've tested it extensively in the past few years and it's kind of my reference vis-a-vis -vis what a Canon mirrorless cameras can do today, excluding the most expensive models of course. The R7 piqued my interest right away because of the APS-C sensor and its crop factor and what looks like a nice blend of high-level specification with a competitive price. So let's begin and let's see how these two cameras compare. Here we have our two cameras, the R6 and the R7. The R6 is larger and heavier, but after using both side by side for over a month, I can say the difference is not very significant. Both cameras are well built and they are weather sealed. The grip is slightly taller and larger on the R6, which allows my fingers to rest with more comfort. On the R7, I need to squeeze them a little more, but it's a small thing really, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Concerning the button layout, the R6 features three dials, two on top and one on the rear to control the exposure settings. The R7 has only two dials, one on top near the front grip and one on the rear next to the viewfinder. While going back and forth between these two cameras, I did miss not having a third dial on the APC model. Now I need to talk about this rear dial slash F joystick combination on the R7. It certainly is an original solution, but it turned out to be a big annoyance because I ended up touching the joystick accidentally a lot of times. It sticks a bit too much from the main body, I think, and many times I found my autofocus point in a different position. You also have to be careful not to touch the dial itself unintentionally. One solution is to use the lock button found at the top of the camera. I configured this so that it only affects the rear wheel and the joystick, nothing else. This way I can lock them both and not worry about changing shutter speed or moving the autofocus point by accident. The drawback is that every time you do want to change the settings, you have to remember to press the lock button first. It takes a bit of muscle memory to get used to it and, of course, it's not as quick as with the R6. Another solution is to simply disable the joystick and use the 4-way pad to move the autofocus area but I find the joystick quicker and more responsive. On the top plate, the on-off switch is found on the left for the R6 and on the right for the R7. I like the solution on the APS-C camera better because you can switch to movie mode more quickly, rather than rotating the main dial on the R6. At the front, near the bottom, the R7 has a handy autofocus manual focus switch that includes a center button and that can be customized. The R6 has a few extra buttons on the rear, but the R7 offers more customization. 12 buttons can be configured, including the 4-way pad at the rear, versus only 7 on the R6. Furthermore, the Q menu can be edited on the APS-C camera, unlike with the full-frame model. The menu system is the same and can be controlled entirely via the touchscreen. Both cameras include a My Menu section to shortcut your favorite settings. The R6 has a larger viewfinder with more resolution and magnification. The eye point is slightly longer and overall, the experience is more pleasant, especially for someone like me who wears glasses all the time. The R7 has a decent viewfinder but it certainly feels outdated by today's standards. At least the frame rate is fast, which is good when panning quickly to follow fast subjects. Concerning the LCD monitor on the rear, they are both touch sensitive, have a multi-angle mechanism and share the same resolution. They are responsive, bright and sharp, so I have nothing to complain here. The two cameras use the same battery and they do well when it comes to battery life but the R7 has the upper hand. For example, I capture more than 1,700 RAW images of birds in flight at 20 frames per second with the R6 and there was 79% of battery power left. The R7, with more photos in the SD card in the same conditions, only consumed one extra percentage of battery life. Really good performance. 
The two cameras share the same connections, microphone input, remote input, headphone output, a micro HDMI input, and a 10 gigabit per second USB-C port. Finally, they both have two SD card slots that are UHS-2 compatible. The R6 features a full-frame sensor, or 35mm format, which is larger than the APS-C sensor found on the R7. The crop factor in this case is 1.6 times. The resolution is also different. The R6 comes with 20.1 megapixel, whereas the R7 has 32.5 megapixel. The APS-C crop factor combined with the high resolution of the R7 sensor can be very useful, but there are other advantages with the full-frame sensor. One of them is dynamic range. The R6 shows less noise when brightening underexposed areas on the raw file. The difference is already visible with a mild two-stop recovery, and even more so with a more extreme four-stop recovery. The amount of details preserved in the highlights is much more similar, however, as you can see in this third example. Then we have the ISO, and first of all, the R6 has a vaster range, as you can see. The larger sensor and the lower megapixel count help the R6 to deliver images with less noise, as you increase the ISO level. The difference starts to really show from 3200. I have to say the R7 performs well up to 6400, all things considered, but it is obvious you can push the R6 to higher extremes. I wanted to check if there would be any difference with the JPEG output and the built-in color profiles, and indeed there are some. Overall, the R7 has less reds than the R6. The difference is more difficult to see when using the standard or neutral profile, but it is evident when selecting the portrait style. Note that these results are also valid for video. Both cameras feature an advanced autofocus system, the Canon Dual Pixel CMOS AF2, and include subject recognition such as humans, animals, and vehicles. They can focus on their body, head, or eyes, or the helmet in the case of motorcycles and open cockpit racing cars. What's interesting about Canon cameras is that the animals or vehicle setting doesn't exclude humans. For example, if a person and a dog are in the same frame, the dog will get priority when choosing animal detection. However, if the dog goes away and only the human is left, you can still focus on the face and eyes of that person automatically, even with the animal setting enabled. If we dig a bit more, we can find some differences. For example, we have the AF zone setting, which is called AF method on the R6. The R7 has three custom modes that allow you to create an area of any size you want, Furthermore, subject detection can be enabled from any AF zone. On the R6, your only option to work with subject detection is to select the tracking setting, which operates on the entire sensor. This may seem like a small improvement, but the extra flexibility of the R7 can be useful. For example, during my IAF test, the R6 struggled to recognize the subject at the beginning, when she was far from the camera meaning small in the frame. The R6 started to switch various autofocus points in different parts of the frame, liking the kitchen bar in particular. I had to touch the subject on the LCD screen for the R6 to give her priority and forget about the rest. On the R7, you can simply select a small autofocus area and keep it on the person at the center. If the subject is detected, the camera will still track him or her on the entire frame, but if it doesn't detect the subject for whatever reason or just momentarily, it will focus where your autofocus point is. And all this really means you have more control with the R7 depending on your needs. 
My face and eye detection test showed a very similar performance between these two products. The R6 gave me the same keeper rate of previous tests I made. It only struggled when the subject moved away from the camera, delivering four out-of-focus shots in a row. The R7 gave me a slightly higher keeper rate. It had less problems when the subject walked away from the camera, but there were more images that lacked pin-sharp focus. For video, the performance is very similar, although the R7 showed a bit more hesitation when the subject was turning on herself, taking more time to refocus on the eyes when they became visible again. A quick note about this test. I used the RF 85mm f2 macro and I know some of you will say the autofocus motor of this lens is not great and that I should have used an L lens instead. However, the 85mm f2 is currently the only affordable native portrait lens you can buy for the system. The 1.2 version is much more expensive and the f2.8 zooms are also more expensive. So realistically, R6 and R7 owners especially will settle for the less expensive lens, and my test gives them a realistic idea of what to expect. I think this is more useful and more fair than mounting the most expensive lens I can find that not everybody can afford. Now let's talk about animal detection. When photographing slow or static subjects, both cameras perform really well. They are fast and extremely reliable. You can see here how these birds are detected right away even if they are tiny in the frame. Focus is very accurate, whether you walk at a distance or you have the chance to get close to your subject. The camera will switch to the head or eye as soon as possible, increasing your chances to get optimal sharpness where it matters the most. Even with small birds perched on a tree, surrounded by distracting elements in the foreground and background, the cameras are very capable and the keeper rate is high. You can also see in this example where the bird is not facing the camera, how the R7 still managed to nail focus on the eye, and it did that on multiple occasions. One thing that can lower the performance is the lens used. With the 100-500mm, speed and accuracy is flawless, but with the less expensive 100-400mm, I found both cameras to hunt a bit more than I would like. Now let's move on to my birds in flight test that many of you like, and this is where I found an important difference between these two cameras. The R6 is on another level, and actually it has very little to envy from the flagship R3 as far as autofocus performance goes. The camera received the various firmware updates that improve the AF stability, it is a camera you can trust, and the moments where it struggles are rare. The R7 had a more difficult time, not only because of the lower hit rate, but also because its performance lacked consistency. The R7 can lock on the target really fast, but can also lose it as fast when there is a busy background, focusing on the trees or field behind. Other times, it could not correct focus when the first images of the burst were out of focus, so much that I had to abort the sequence and start again on many occasions. As always, I tried different setting combinations to see if I could improve the results, but to no avail. Here we have the autofocus score. I've also included other Canon cameras for comparison. As always, the green percentage includes 100% sharp images only. The blue percentage also includes slightly soft results. As I said earlier, the performance on the R7 is not consistent. 80% is the best score I got, but the following days I had a lower hit rate, averaging between 72% and 75%, even when using the same lens and the same exact settings. The score with the R6 has been consistent since the first time I tried the camera two years ago, so that is something important to highlight. If I compare the two cameras with other brands, this is where they stand. Of course, some of these cameras have a slower drive speed, others are faster. You can find out more about my birds in flight test on my website, the link is in the description. For those of you that are interested, 
These are the settings for Birds in Flight that gave me the best results on both cameras. Next, we have low light performance. You can see on screen the official rating, which gives the R6 an advantage of one stop and a half. Both cameras can also walk down to f22 with phase detection autofocus and continuous shooting, which is useful with small aperture lenses and teleconverters. This test is a bit extreme. There are only two weak and crappy lights in the background and foreground. You can see from the exposure settings it was a situation hopefully you won't find yourself into. I wasn't expecting a great keeper rate, but both cameras managed to follow the subject from start to finish, although focus was not always accurate. The R6 had an easier time overall. And here you can watch the same test for video. One more thing. Both cameras have focus bracketing, but only the R7 can do focus stacking in camera. With the R6, you'll have to stack the images in post. Focus stacking on the R7 works well if you select the right settings, most importantly, the focus increments. You can see in this first example, the increments were too wide, and the final results show this weird glow around the edge of the shell. With smaller increments, this is less likely to happen, and the second photo is perfect. Both cameras come with 5-axis image stabilization and that can be also combined with optical stabilization and actually most of the RF lenses have optical stabilization and I think Canon built the system to work with the lenses and not just the sensor alone, although there are a few exceptions of course. I did my usual handheld test and only the R6 managed to give me a sharp shot with a shutter speed of 2 seconds. At 1 second however, the R7 gave me a better keeper rate. With faster exposures, the results are very similar. Overall, this is a very good performance from both cameras. For video, the R7 does a bit better in stabilizing the footage when walking. It's not perfect, but you get a bit less jerks than the R6. On both cameras, you can also enable digital IS, but I rarely find this to make a huge difference. Both cameras have a mechanical shutter, an electronic first curtain shutter, and of course a full electronic shutter mode. Speaking of the mechanical shutter, the R7 is louder than the R6 as you're about to hear. The R6 can work up to 12 frames per second with the mechanical shutter, or 20 frames per second when using the electronic shutter. The R7 is superior with both shutter modes. Now, the extra speed offered by the electronic shutter is great, but one thing to keep in mind is distortion when moving quickly with the camera or when your subject moves very fast. You can see right now how this affects your image. The distortion is more contained on the R6, especially when panning quickly. A street lamp is an easy target to highlight this problem because it has a basic vertical shape. But what about more complex bodies such as animals, birds, and so on? This time I'm going a bit more in depth than usual on this topic and you'll see why in a minute. I've tested many cameras for birds in flight using the electronic shutter from older models such as the Olympus EM1 Mark II and the Panasonic G9 to high-end products such as the Canon R3 or Sony A1 and of course many cameras in between, the A9, the R6, X-T4, etc, etc. All these cameras have a different sensor readout speed, which is the amount of time it takes for the camera to read all the pixels from top to bottom. The A1, the A9, the Nikon Z9, 
and the R3 are among the fastest you can find and they will give you the least amount of problems. But what about other cameras? Well, as long as the sensor readout is fast enough, you can use the electronic shutter with confidence in most situations. This is valid for the Canon R6. I've used this camera many times for birds in flight and I never encountered real problems with it. Of course, that doesn't mean it cannot happen. And this is why I always do the rolling shutter test for photos and not just video. In the case of the R6, I believe you need to move really, really fast or have a very, very fast subject like one of those small birds that flap their wings at incredible speed. With the R7, rolling shutter is much more visible to a point where every four, three or four image I was reviewing on my computer, I could see something was off. My brain would tell me something is not right here either because of distortion on the animal itself or distortion in the background. The difference between viewing R6 photos and R7 photos is staggering in this case. Let me show you some examples. In this first image, concentrate your attention on the hide and the tree trunk in the background. They are visibly distorted. Second image, and here you can notice the odd vertical lines of the tractor. Next, I'm showing you two images and I'm going back and forth between them. Can you see how the background wobbles? The fourth image has a bad composition. I struggled to keep the bird at the center as it suddenly moved down. But look at the size of its body and head. They are stretched, making the animal look fatter than it is. Another thing I noticed on the first day of shooting with the R7 was some weird, I'm going to call it motion blur. It was very windy that day, so the red kites would suddenly move up or down and I had to correct the composition really fast, faster than I would usually do. I think this very fast correction with the camera highlighted another problem, the image stabilization on the sensor. It is true that you don't need stabilization when working with fast shutter speeds, but with other cameras like the R6, I never had issues when leaving the image stabilization on, especially when selecting mode 2 on the lens when available, and mode 2 means vertical correction only. Now, the thing to understand is that you cannot separate sensor and optical stabilization. They either work together or they don't work at all. So even though optical stabilization is likely to have a greater impact with long focal lens, the sensor remains active and corrects for movements as well. And I believe on a camera like the R7, these corrections on the sensor are counterproductive when doing action shots. Better to use a safe shutter speed and leave the stabilization system off. But even without stabilization, rolling shutter on the R7 is going to be a problem more times than you would like, which is a shame really. And I just showed you some wildlife examples, but I can imagine sports or events with artificial lights can give you problems as well. Of course, you can use the mechanical shutter and work at 15 frames per second, which is far from terrible, but you obviously don't take advantage of the faster drive speed the camera has to offer. Moving on to the buffer, the R6 has a clear advantage, aided by the smaller resolution, smaller files, and slower frame rate. You can double the buffer on the R7 by choosing Compress RAW, which is smaller in size than the normal RAW file. This option is also available on the R6, by the way, and gives you unlimited performance at 20 frames per second. The difference in quality between RAW and Compress RAW is minimal, and in most situations, you won't have any problem post-processing your images with the Compress RAW version. You can see for yourself in this test, after recovering four stops of exposure in the shadows. Next, we can talk about the raw burst mode, which is only available on the R7. The raw burst mode works at the fastest speed with the electronic shutter and is designed to capture a very fast action and give you the possibility of saving the perfect frame, a bit like the 4K photo mode on Panasonic cameras. You also have the option to enable pre-shooting, which allows you to capture images 0.5 seconds before the shutter button is fully pressed so roughly 15 images with a drive speed of 30 frames per second. The buffer keeps refreshing to give you the latest 15 frames when you press the shutter button all the way down. 
Note that the shutter button needs to be pressed halfway for pre-shooting to engage. Pre-shooting is helpful to capture unpredictable moments, like for example, a small bird flying off a branch or departing from a feeder or landing on a feeder. While this function sounds like a nice tool to use, there is one major limitation in addition to the rolling shutter problem I've already described. The camera doesn't save all the frames individually, but combines them into one large file called a roll file. It has the same CR3 extension, but popular software such as Lightroom or Photoshop won't open it. You only have two options, either select the frames you want to save directly in camera or use the Canon Digital Photo Professional software on your computer. In both cases, you can extract individual RAW files and then you can transfer them to your favorite editor. But unfortunately, you cannot save multiple frames at the same time. You have to go through one by one, and that will take a lot of time if you use this function extensively during the day. I can understand why a batch save would not be available on the camera, but I struggle to understand why a digital photo professional doesn't allow you to do it. There is a way to select multiple frames, but they are saved in another roll file and you're back to square one. So you either are very patient or you might just give up on this feature, unless you are happy to work with the Canon software, I suppose. The R6 and R7 are capable of recording 4K up to 60 frames per second. In Full HD, they can go up to 120 frames per second with the high frame rate function. The bit rate is also the same. The R6 applies a small crop in 4K, whether you record at 30 or 60p, but it works by oversampling from a 5K area in each case, so you always get the optimal quality. The R7 can record without sensor crop with two quality settings. Choose Fine, and the R7 saves 4K at the maximum quality over sampling from a 7K area. The Fine setting is available up to 30p, and I find it to give very similar results to the R6, as you can see here. If you want 4K 50 or 60p on the R7, you have two options. You can record without sensor crop, but the quality decreases because instead of oversampling, the camera does line skipping, which means it doesn't use all the pixels on the sensor. Details are less crisp, and you can notice some aliasing. The second option is to record on a 1 to 1 pixel area, which translates into a severe 1.8 times crop. The latter means a small portion of the sensor is used to record the video. Remember that you also have to take into account the equivalence due to the different sensor size, full frame, APS-C, and related crop factor. If we take a 35mm prime lens as an example, here is the equivalent focal length in terms of field of view you would get depending on the camera used, as well as the specific 4K settings you select. You can see how narrow the angle of view becomes on the R7 with the 1 to 1 pixel mode. The two cameras can record 10-bit 422 internally, but only when selecting the Canon Log or HDR PQ profiles. With other picture styles, they record 8-bit 420. The R7 surprised me concerning dynamic range. With the Canon Log 3 profile, it holds up really well against the full-frame camera, and actually I found a bit more noise in the shadows of the R6 footage. The full-frame model offers an additional profile, the Canon Log, that works with a native ISO of 400 rather than ISO 800 with C-Log3. At high ISO, the range is a bit more limited than for still photos, as you can see. As expected, the R7 displays more noise, while the R6 can be pushed further. These were recorded with noise reduction set to standard on both cameras.
Concerning rolling shutter, the R6 suffers more than in still photo mode, and the two cameras can display a lot of it on a similar level. One way to reduce the distortion is to record at 50, 60p rather than 24, 25, or 30p. Finally, let's talk about overheating. The R6 has a bad reputation with this, and unfortunately, my own experience kind of confirms it. Despite firmware updates, my tests consistently show the same result. The R6 can record the first 30 minutes without any problems, but once the second clip is rolling, it can shut down after 15 or 20 minutes. From there, how much you can record depends on how long you let the camera cool. For example, a 5 minute break allowed me to record another 20 minutes. Obviously, if you plan to do some shooting in the summer or in warm locations, the R6 will give you problems. Fortunately, the R7 is doing much better. I managed to record 2 hours and 20 minutes in 4K 25p at the maximum quality. The temperature indicator, which is a very clever implementation by the way, appeared after 45 minutes and slowly increased to 7 bars out of 10 by the time the battery ran out. The camera was mildly warm by then. Also to note that the R7 doesn't have the 30 minute per clip limitation unlike the R6. The R6 is more expensive as you can see with the graphics, and this is no doubt the biggest decision making factor if you're hesitating between these two cameras. Another topic to mention are the lenses. The two cameras use the RF mount, but so far there are only two native lenses designed for APS-C, one kit lens and one do-it-all kind of lens. Naturally, we can expect more to come in the future, but for now, you'll have to look at the full frame catalog if you want anything beyond these two lenses. As I said earlier, there is an advantage in using full frame lenses on the R7 because of the APS-C crop factor. For example, the 100-400mm gives you an equivalent field of view of 160-640mm, whereas the RF 800mm f11 extends, so to speak, to 1280mm. And if we consider the higher pixel count on the APS-C camera, you have more leeway for cropping in post and get even more magnification. The disadvantages are A, it can be more difficult to find extreme wide angle lenses unless you look at third party manual focus lenses, and B, there aren't a lot of affordable yet fast lenses from Canon at the moment. There are some interesting primes like the RF16 f2.8, the 35 1.8, the 50mm 1.8, and a few others which is not bad of course, but most of the f2.8 or f4 constant aperture zooms will cost you much more. Even the 100-500mm that I've used many times is almost 3 grand. I also think the system could do with support from third party manufacturers such as Sigma and Tamron. Of course, we have to give Canon a bit of time to grow the APS-C segment, so this chapter is not meant to be a criticism necessarily, but rather to give you extra information. Hopefully, if you're watching this video a few years from now, there will be more choice for APS-C. In the meantime, you have a second option, which is to use the EOS R to EF adapter and choose from a long list of APS-C and full frame lenses designed for Canon DSLRs. The adapter works really well, you get autofocus and everything, nothing that can be especially useful if you already own EF mount lenses. When the R7 was announced, I was pleased to see the RF mount expanding in the APS-C territory. The camera promised high-level specs for a competitive price, and actually, the price was great to see since cameras are becoming more and more expensive nowadays. And naturally, as a wildlife photography enthusiast, I saw great potential for this camera. But after testing the R7 for more than a month, I can say I have very mixed feelings about it. For some people, I think it can be an excellent entry to Canon's EOS R system. It offers excellent resolution, good image and video quality, up to 30p, and the autofocus performance is excellent for the most part. It has very good battery life and much better heat management when recording 4K video. However, as soon as you start to push the R7 to its highest performance, 
there are important limitations to be aware. The drive speed of 30 frames per second sounds great, but you have to deal with a small buffer and invasive rolling shutter, which is also valid for video, by the way. The robust setting gives you the pre-shooting mode, but the limited workflow built around it will frustrate more than one photographer. From an ergonomics point of view, the design is very good except for that large wheel located around the AF joystick, which I struggle to get used to. The R6 is a camera I still praise today. The 20 megapixel sensor doesn't feel like much by today's standards when it comes to resolution, but you get better dynamic range and better high ISO. The 20 frames per second speed with the electronic shutter is more reliable thanks to the faster sensor readout and buffer is almost limitless. The autofocus on the R6 does better with difficult subjects such as birds in flight, and the camera offers better quality if you want 4K 60p. The overheating problems, however, stops me from recommending the R6 for video work. In the end, the price will be the main factor at play here. The difference is not insignificant unless you can find a second-hand R6 at a good price. Also pay attention to the lenses. The choice for APS-C is limited if you just look at the native RF mount, and many full-frame lenses are expensive. The Canon EOS R APS-C segment has just started and needs to grow. Finally, a few words about the Canon R6 Mark II that was announced at the beginning of November 2022 while I was testing these two cameras. The second generation model has a new sensor with a faster readout, and the drive speed doubles, which is quite impressive. The autofocus can detect more type of animals in addition to receiving an overall software improvement. And, hopefully, overheating when recording 4K video should be a thing of the past. I hope to test the new camera, but I think the R6 will remain a good contender for the R7, especially if it comes down in price. And I believe you reached the end of this video, so thank you very much for watching. I hope you found it useful. As always, leave a comment if you have any question. Please consider liking and subscribing, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.